It's time to tune in to Defending the Faith with Frank Harbor. Hear the latest about religious liberty. A win for religious freedom in one of the remaining blockbuster cases facing the U.S. Supreme Court this term. A legal battle continues for the Little Sisters of the Poor for nearly a decade now. A street preacher armed with a speaker, a microphone, and a camera strapped to his chest is now banned from the village. Our founding fathers believed in the separation of church and state, but not for one fleeting moment. Did they believe in the separation of God and government? And powerful apologetics. Are you prepared to defend the faith? I'm convinced unless we trust in God, this nation is finished. We're facing a new kind of enemy. We're involved in a new kind of warfare. And we need the help of the Spirit of God. Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Defending the Faith. I am Frank Harbor, and I am the president and chief legal counsel for Defending the Faith Alliance. We defend the faith. We help people uh, with legal cases across the country. Uh, We defend religious liberty. We have several active legal cases going right now that are very, very exciting, making it possible for people to share the message of Christ everywhere. We also Uh, defend the faith through helping people understand why Christianity is true. And there are many different areas which demonstrate uh, that Christianity is truthful. Unlike many religions that don't have any substance or evidence, that's not what we find concerning the Bible. The Bible can be verified historically, uh, scientifically. Uh, It can be verified through the predictive prophecies in the Bible. Um, But also uh, the, the Bible can be uh, be verified by science, and there's a lot of great sciences out there that help demonstrate that there is a God. I think one of the most fascinating areas, though, is astronomy, uh, particularly because when the Bible starts out in the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the Bible tells us not just that God created the heavens and the earth, but you know, God gets very specific on the order that he creates these things that hopefully we'll, we'll have our expert talk about here in just a moment. And they have stunning ramifications for what could and could not have happened because some of the modern explanations that we hear that are hypothesis or theories, I don't think line up with the Bible and are therefore suspect to be trusted and to believed. And so we're going to find out about some of this stuff today because we have Dr. Danny Faulkner uh, on the show, and he has a PhD in astronomy. Dr. Faulkner coming to us from Kentucky. How are you doing today? Very good. I'm glad to be here. Well, I have not met many people ever in my life that have a PhD in astronomy. How does one grow up as a kid and go, that's what I want to do. I want to look through a telescope the rest of my life. Well, actually, I didn't think about that until I was in high school, but I've always been fascinated with, with astronomy. I remember looking up uh, in the sky, sitting on the front stoop of our home, and looking up the sky at night and seeing the stars and being fascinated. <clears throat> and I was, I was probably no older than four years old at the time because we, we moved away shortly thereafter from the place that I, I remember sitting there. And in grade school, I, I would you know, read the library books we had at school and just loved astronomy. Didn't know a lot about it, but I, I really liked it. Never gave any thought about what I would do with my life until my sophomore year of high school. A number of things came together that year. One of them was I, I read a book by a man you may have heard of, Henry Morris. Oh, yes. It was the first blatantly creationist book I'd ever read, and he made a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, through that process and other things going on, I decided that that was God's calling for me in life, to, to be an astronomer for his glory. So I've been on that track since high school over a half century ago now. And so then you go on to college and you go on to grad school. It takes a long time to prepare. But, but here I am after a half century or more. Wow. And where did you get this Ph.D. from? Indiana University uh, in Bloomington. And after that, I uh, took a position as a professor at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster. Mm -hmm. I taught uh, astronomy and physics there. And I uh, taught there for more than a quarter century. I had an opportunity to retire a little early. And so 10 years ago, that's what I did. End of this calendar year, I will have completed 10 years working at Answers in Genesis. 
I want to make it very clear, I didn't run away from a situation there. I, I thrived there at the university I taught at. Um, and I, I could have easily spent the rest of my life there. I love the town, love my neighbors, love the school, love my job, love the church I had. It took a lot to pry me out of there. But I always had in the back of my mind, in my heart, deep in my heart, if I ever did retire, quote unquote, from the university, wherever I would happen to be, um, I, I thought that I would want to pursue creation ministry full time afterwards. And my wife and I discussed it many times. And Answers in Genesis seemed to be the, the leading we had. So the Lord really provided there. I, I signed up to re, set up for retirement. And uh, five days later, Jason Lyle, my predecessor here at Answers in Genesis, uh, sent in his uh, resignation letter, a uh, two weeks notice. So they, they were looking for somebody and I was kind of looking for the place to go. So the Lord's timing couldn't have been more perfect on this on this relocation. So I could be happy here. I'm just, I left one fantastic job for another fantastic job. Oh, it's such a blessing to the kingdom of God that you've done that. And you know, uh, you've written several books. The book that we're going to talk about today is called The Heavens, but we have beseeched New Leaf Press to get you back on here, you know, for some of your other stuff, because, you know, you're very unique and what you have to say. And it's just, uh, you know, this, this book right here, it's just a tremendous, tremendous resource. And so, you know, I want to, you know, uh, jump into this today. Um, now, this book is particularly interesting because of the photography. And so you have a term for it called astrophotography, and uh, it reveals these these wonders of God. But this has really come a long way recently, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I only got into astrophotography about six or seven years ago. I can't remember exactly when now. I could have got into it uh, all along, but it required uh, some pretty specialized equipment. You needed a camera that you could open up the, well, there are two ways you can do astrophotography. One is to just uh, mount a camera on a tripod and open up the shutter for, uh, let's say, 30 minutes or something, or even 15 seconds, different ISO settings on your on your film. I use the term film. People may not know that term. Young people may not know that term anymore. And... Uh, uh, and see what this sky produces. Another another way of doing it is to detach the lens from the camera and then attach uh, it with a special mount to a telescope and use the, the telescope lens or mirror as the camera lens. And that allows you to take up, up close photos of the moon and planets and even nebulae and so forth. It requires that you have uh, pretty dark skies. It requires that you have a, a good clock drive on a, on a nice telescope. Requires at least to have a tripod and a good camera. A 35 millimeter camera used to be the standard with a, with a single lens reflex. That's still pretty important. I just never did that because back in the days of film, it was expensive, required a lot of equipment I didn't have, and so forth. And so a few years ago, I realized, well, I, I'm at this point in life, I can actually do this. I have access to nice telescopes, and I had a digital SLR camera that I just bought, so I started doing this. And my intent at first was to just uh, develop and get some pictures that I could uh, take for uh, illustration of some of my uh, my work and my books and articles and so forth. As you said, it's come a long way because about two decades ago, the film kind of got displaced by digital cameras. And these digital cameras are incredible. They can uh, uh, you can collect in a, in a minute what used to take an hour. You can collect light in, in a second that used to take a minute. So I'm seeing amateurs now, and plus with computer controls and Photoshop and such, you can you can amateurs now can can produce better uh, images of things that uh, astronomers generally could could do say 30 years ago. It's a, it's, it's incredible. I'm just my mind is blown by how much progress has been made in astrophotography and and what amateur astronomers are now doing. The equipment available to them as well as is, is, wasn't there before. So. Uh, you're right, it has come a long way. And along the way, I found two amateur astronomers who are very supportive of Answers in Genesis. They're recent creations as well. And they were taking nice photos. When I found that out, I said, please, can you give me your photos? I, I really want to use them. And so I, I will illustrate uh, some of my articles that way. Then I got this idea of a book, uh, putting it into a picture book. Uh, Tom Vale started Canyon Ministries. Uh, we, that's working in Grand Canyon. We've we, here at Answers in Genesis. We do several raft trips a year in conjunction in partnership with Answers uh, with um, Canyon Ministries. In fact, I'm doing one next month uh, through them. And uh, 
about uh, 20 years ago, Tom uh, wrote a book called Grand Canyon, A Different View, and it included his stunning photographs that he and others have taken of Grand Canyon, plus essays that he and other people wrote about the geology and the implications dealing with recent creation and flood. Uh, people may know that uh, <clears throat> geologists, well, when it comes to uh, geological evolution, uh, evolutionists use Grand Canyon as their, as their really uh, exhibit A that they, they have. And so this is, uh, they entitled the book Grand Canyon, A Different View, giving you a different interpretation to it. Then about five, six years ago, Georgia Purdom, a biologist here at Answers in Genesis, she uh, she did a similar thing. She went to the Galapagos Islands, as you may well know. That's used as exhibit A for biological evolution. So her book was called Galapagos, A Different View. And I thought, well, why not do the same thing this time for the heavens and call it a different view? That's where the book came out. So it's like the third in a series for master books uh, having this theme. Uh, I did write all the essays in this particular book myself, which is a little different from the others because there were several other, several authors that worked on those. But we relied almost exclusively upon the photographs of those two amateur astronomers plus a few of mine. I might add, by the way, uh, I think I'm making good progress on the photographs I take, astrophotos I take, and then I see the work of these two other gentlemen and I'm just uh, asking the question, why do I bother? <laughs> because they're way ahead of me. They're really, really good. So if you want to know who, who did particular photographs, we document that in each of the each of the photos. This is just excellent stuff. And uh, I'm always thankful for for technical things. My my two sons, Hunter and Graham, whom you met earlier, produced the show and I would just be lost without them. But, you know, I find what you, you're doing so fascinating because it seems like, you know, uh, there's there's two instruments where we can see beyond what our eyes can see. We can look through a microscope and we can see this, you know, the cellular world. And, and that world, I think the more that you look through that microscope, the more you're going to see design for God. But a lot of people don't comprehend that when you look, start looking through that telescope, you're going to see things there that also indicate des God's design um, like the sun. So it's the source of nuclear energy. Could you talk about that? Yeah, the sun uh, produces, we have pretty good evidence now that the sun derives its energy from a nuclear source. The uh, Down deep in the core of the sun, the sun is, is converting hydrogen to helium, fusing it together. And as it does, it, it releases energy. We could only hope that we could do that on the, on the earth. It requires a very high temperature. That's why fusion power has not been harnessed yet. Uh, we do have nuclear bombs that work that, work yeah. that way, but the temperature's on you know, the order of a few million degrees, so it's, it's really, uh, really tough. But the sun handles it very well, very stable. And uh, people, uh, the, the sun, we believe, could, could burn or, or continue to shine by this energy source for 8, 10 billion years. And you may wonder, well, if the universe is only uh, thousands of years old, how, how in the world, why in the world did God give us such a long-lived uh, source of energy? And the answer to that, I believe, is stability. If the sun were to derive its energy from some other source, say gravitational potential energy, which, by the way, the sun could very well do that, it would not uh, last nearly as long. The sun's luminosity would change uh, throughout human history, as it turns out. And there would also be some other instabilities perhaps taking place. That's not good. So I think the Lord uh, provided that the sun have a long-term long stable source for our benefit, also interesting is that for the past half century or so, some astronomers are trying to find what we call solar analogs, stars that are just like the sun. Uh, we say that the sun is a G2 dwarf or G2 main sequence star. Uh, it's got a certain temperature and size, like and the other stars are similar to it. But what's interesting, stars that are also G2 main sequence stars like the sun tend to be variable. They tend to uh, change brightness by a few percent. They get a little brighter, they get a little fainter. And the sun is unusually stable for a star of its type. Uh, a long time ago, we used to take it for granted that all G2 stars, main sequence stars, were stable. They're not. They've now found a few true analogs, stars that are about as stable as the sun is. The sun actually does vary by a little bit, but it's a tiny fraction of a percent. It's not very much at all. If the sun were to vary by a few percent, like its typical uh, call the analogs, um, I think most people would realize the problem there. You know, people are, real, are worried about just a small change in the heating of the earth, uh, giving climate change, global, uh, global warming and such. Well, you can imagine if the sun were changing by a few percent, what well, that would do, that'd be really bad news. So the, uh, the sun is not only stable long-term, but it's also in the short-term, which makes it unusual. 
Uh, so the brightness of the sun is also interesting because how does that affect the dating of the the universe? Oh, repeat the question, please. Um, the the sun's brightness. Uh, how does that in, uh, you know impact the theory of the Earth being billions of years old? Oh, uh, the um, it, tur- it turns out the same nuclear source that we have uh, will cause the sun to slowly increase in brightness over time. Uh, that's pretty straightforward from the nuclear physics and the physics of, of gases and so forth. It's a whole thing you study in, in grad school called a whole semester called stellar interiors where you try to model what stars do. And we've got some marvelous models that work very well for the star, sun and other stars. But the thing is, um, it, it says that the, the sun should increase in brightness, and we can run the numbers on that. It's about a, um, since the sun formed, supposedly formed, I should say, four and a half billion years ago, the sun should have brightened by about 25, about 40%. And since life supposedly appeared about three and a half billion years ago, the sun should have brightened by about 25, uh, 25%. And if you run the numbers, and I have on this just to make sure, uh, if nothing else changed, then the, the since life first appeared on the Earth three and a half billion years ago, according to evolutionists, the, this, the Earth should have warmed by about uh, 17 degrees Celsius. And now, the average temperature of the Earth today is around 15 Celsius. So if you just subtract 17 from 15, you get minus 2, which is like 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That would have been the average temperature of the earth. Um, the tropics would have been warmer than average, but the uh, much of the, the the Arctic and Antarctic and much of the northern temperate latitudes would be far below that average. It's pretty clear that the earth would have become an ice ball. It would have um, uh, produced a lot of ice that covered the earth, uh, covered the oceans. And once you get in that, that regime, the light uh, is reflected by the bright, bright ice and that inhibits any more warming. And the entire planet becomes uh, an ice ball. Kind of reminds me of the second uh, Star Wars movie they made around 1980. They had this ice planet. That's exactly the sort of thing that you would have. And the Earth would have never recovered from that, as it turns out. Um, Yet no geologist or biologist believes the Earth was ever like that in the past. They believe the Earth has had kind of a constant temperature. And so that's become known as the um, young faint sun paradox. Uh, Why was the sun, uh, why was the Earth, uh, warmer than it should have been, according according to all this. And there have been, in the last 20 years or more, probably 25 years, there have been like four or five different uh, proposed explanations for this. The fact that they keep proposing explanations indicates that none of them really work at all. But, you know, if the, if the Earth is really um, quite young, and the sun's quite young, thousands of years old, this isn't a problem at all because over tens of thousands of years, the sun is not going to brighten appreciably. It's only over billions of years that it does. So I think the brightness of the sun... And the supposed, well, clearly from the from what we know about the nuclear physics, it's going to have to drive uh, uh, a brighter sun over the years. And so I, I think that's a strong indication that the sun and the Earth are not nearly as old as, as most scientists seem to think. Of course, a lot of people, they look into outer space and they see the, you know, the evidence of billions of years of light years, you know, that it takes for the light to get here. And so a lot of people will say, hey, the science is right there that is pointing to, uh, an, you know, this old universe model. How would you respond to that? Uh, that's that's uh, discuss that in the book as well. The, uh-huh. uh, I give pictures of different galaxies in there. The Andromeda galaxy, for instance, is the closest galaxy of any size. It's like 2 million light years away and others are 10, 20, 30 million light years away. I'm very careful to give distances in there if we think we know them. Uh, you could you see a problem there because if the if the light year indicates time, then uh, it would suggest that, that the universe is millions of years old, if not older, not thousands of years. We have a we have a name for this. It's such a big problem for us. It's called the light travel time problem. I became aware of this uh, well 50 years ago when I started doing uh, seriously considering doing a, a creation astronomy. And that requires an answer. There have been several several solutions over the years. And I've, I've taken a, a different approach from most. Many of them trying to come up with what I would call a scientific explanation. But um, that's using today's science and extrapolating it back during the creation week. And I don't think we ought to be doing that. There's a term for that. It's called uniformitarianism. So my, my solution is to, is to look at the creation and realize uh, that uh, God used some process during the creation week to create things. For instance, he didn't make man 
instantaneously, poof, out of nothing, he made him form out of the dust of the ground. It took a little time to do that. He formed Eve from his side. That took a little time as well. If you look carefully in chapters of 1 and 2 of Genesis, it tells us that the um, uh, animals came from the dust of the ground as well. And the birds in chapter 2 says came from the dust of the ground. So a little bit of process involved in those, in each one of those. And also, if you look um, on day three, God created the plants out of the ground. They grew up out of the ground. If you look at the words involved there, talking about the, the earth bringing forth all of the, um, the plants that we see, it suggests a um, uh, like a time-lapse movie of these things growing up out of the ground and, and reaching maturity, um, kind of maturing very quickly. Um, my friend Eric Hoven did a book, uh, a movie a few years ago called uh, Genesis Paradise Lost. We used to show the first 20 minutes or so uh, here at the Creation Museum in our FX theater from that first 20 minutes or so of that movie. And I love the way it did day three because it's exactly the way I pictured it. He has the depiction of all these plants just ripping up out of the ground and popping out leaves and flowers and seed and so forth. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, at the end of chapter one, it says that all of the uh, animals, and, and as well as man, they were, they were plant eaters. They, they didn't eat meat. They ate plants, the things that God had made on day three. If you would have just waited for them to grow up slowly, everybody would have starved to death because it would take months or years to reach maturity. And they only had like three days uh, to reach that point. So noting that pattern, I, I believe what God did throughout the creation week is he matured things. He created some things ex nihilo, but many things he grew very rapidly or, or matured and produced very quickly. And we see that in verse 2, it talks about the earth being uh, formless and empty. And that's the initial creation. But God spent the next uh, six days creating and transforming the earth to make it to be filled and to be uh, functional and have form to it. And that's a very important concept in, in, in creation. And, you know, most of the days it says at the, at the, during the day or at the end of the day that God saw it was good. At the end of the week, he proclaims it was very good. And this goodness, it took me a long time to really comprehend what that meant. It's referring to the function and purpose. Things were, were created in such a way that they were, they were fulfilling the purposes and functions that God intended for them. Again, the plants for food and so forth. And the lights in the sky, the stars, for instance, have purposes given to us in the day four count. They would not be able to fulfill those purposes, however, if they weren't visible, if not on day four, certainly by the end of day six. And just as God rapidly grew those plants up out of the ground, and he did other things, produced the, the animals on, on days five and six, and man on day six, through a rapid process that brought them to maturity, I fully believe that God rapidly brought that light from um, distant objects. We shift on the day seven from the creation to God sustaining at that point. And this gets back to Hebrews 1, 3 and, and Colossians 1, 16 and 17. It speaks of Jesus as the creator upholding and sustaining the world moment by moment. So the rules are different now than what they were during the creation week. We shouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed to invoke miracles during the creation week. Mm -hmm. In fact, most things we, we creationists recognize as being uh, miracles during the creation week as, as very different from how things operate today. So why should light getting here be any different? Why are you looking for a physical mechanism for this? Why not invoke a miracle? Now, there's a transition between the, the creation, the miracle of creation, and now the miracle of sustaining and I have no idea what that transition is. It's beyond my ability to, to really comprehend that. So I can't really address that question. But the upshot is, is that, that I, I, think, I think I'm saying the, the, the light of the universe was created, uh, was matured. It wasn't created mature. It was matured very quickly to fulfill those functions. So when I look at, look at uh, the Andromeda galaxy, I believe I'm looking at something that's 2 million light years away, give or take a little bit. But I don't think the light's been traveling that long. It's been traveling probably about 6,000 years, I would guess. I would think, Dr. Faulkner, that God making light is the first miracle, but which, you know, according to, I guess, today's science travels at somewhere around 186,000 miles per second. So a beam of light leaves here it's to the moon in two seconds, to the, to the sun in a few minutes. But if God could do the miracle to make light, it seems like, he can control the speed as well, because if God can control the speed, this kind of answers some of this, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I think we're kind of half. Some people are half creationists. I've been guilty of that myself in the past. 
you're willing to grant the miracle of creation, but yet you still want to constrain God to, to, to do things in creation week the way it happens today. And that's just, I think that's wrong. Uh, you, you can't, I can't think of anything else in the creation week other than this that people would say, well, it has to be explained by a physical mechanism. Well, that light on day one is um, directional, apparently, once you separated it. It's, uh, a source is not identified. It's not until day four that God makes the sun, and I think what he did then was transferred whatever the source of that light was on, on day, from day one over on day four to what the sun does today. Um, people speculate about the source of the light, but it would be speculation alone to, to talk about that. Now, as an astronomer, uh, I believe the Bible indicates God makes earth first, then sun, moon, and stars, which I think that would not be taught in secular astronomy, would it? No, you're absolutely correct. The, the Bible makes it very clear that the Earth, I should say proto-Earth, because it took some while to shape it and get it in the form we'd recognize it, but the stuff of Earth was made on uh, the very beginning of day one, yet the sun, the moon, and the stars came around on day four. So it was a three-day three differential to a very good approximation. They were the same age after thousands of years, but still the Earth came first. But in secular astronomy approach, uh, the solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago, and the... Uh, uh, the sun and the moon and the planets, including the Earth, formed through a process over a few hundred, oh, few tens of millions of years, I should say. But um, that was like nine billion years after the universe began, what they call the Big Bang. And so for nine billion or close to nine billion years, there would have been stars forming, and some of which are still around, some of which are not, and stars are continuing to form today. And that really is is beyond what what very contradictory to what what the Bible teaches in Genesis 1. Of course, the Bible talks about God creating the universe with an expansion, and I, I, I believe it's in double digits, the number of verses in the Bible that says God, ex, you know, stretched out the heavens like a tent, like a, like, a, like a curtain. Is that what we observe through the telescope? Well, I think there are 11, 11 verses that say that explicitly, and two or three more that also kind of allude to the language a little different. We talk about stretching out the heavens like a tent. Um, and again, we, it's, what, what's going on with that? One, one opinion, and I used to share this opinion, I no longer do, but one opinion is that's referring to the expansion of the universe, which was discovered in 1929 by Evan Hubble. Almost, we're coming up in the centennial in a few years of this. What he found is that when you look at, uh, at galaxies, if you measure their distances and you measure their redshift, redshift refers to roughly how, how, how fast things are moving away from one another. That's an interpretation of it, at least. Um, the, the two are correlated, which is what you expect if the universe is expanding. So uh, that's actually what the data say, the correlation between redshift and distance. The interpretation is that the universe is expanding, and that is everything's getting farther and farther and farther apart. And it's very tempting for us to say that um, this expansion of the universe, uh, uh, stretching out, I should say, the stretching out of the universe refers to that. However, I, I've changed my mind on that in recent years. I think the... Uh, some of those passages in the Old Testament tense can be difficult, but but uh, some of those passages indicate uh, seem to indicate that it's a past process, and I would more now identify that with what happened on day two. Uh, God made this thing. It says in the King James firmament, and the original Hebrew is rachia. More modern translations say expanse, which gets close to the meaning of what it really is. And so I think on day two, my opinion now is is that God stretched out the the heavens, which is the the um, space of the universe on day two, centered on the earth, and then he filled it on day four with the, with the heavenly bodies. If that's the case, then that expansion or the stretching of the heavens really refers to something that happened on day two, two days before God actually made the stars. I can't prove that, but that's my opinion now. And I'm not going to cast stones at people who uh, want to make that the expansion of the universe. Um, that's fine with me, but I, I, don't, I think that's not the proper interpretation. So... When we when we look out, you know, the God says uh, that he made the sun, the moon, and the stars, and then he tells us the reason, one of the reasons, you know, for signs, seasons, days, and years. So there's some kind of clockwork element where we're able to deduct time from this sure. creation. Yeah, there are three uh, naturally based time units. Uh, one is the day, which is based on the cycle in which the sun moves through the sky, we, more modern problems would say the Earth's rotation period. Uh, the, the longer period one is the year, which is the, or we'd say the orbital period of the sun. It also can be just observed 
the north-south motion of the sun in our sky, and that gives us our seasons. And then uh, that's kind of long. It's 365 and a quarter days, roughly. Then there's an intermediate one called the month, which is about 30 days, uh, close to 30 days, and that's the overall period of the moon. And uh, they're different. Since they don't aren't more integral multiples of each other, then there are different ways you can put calendars together. The Hebrew calendar is a bit different from the modern Gregorian calendar we use. And I don't think the Lord's really terribly concerned about how we do that. But those are the three basic me methods of uh, or definitions of time, uh, time units. And I think they're God ordained from the very beginning using the day four account in, G in Genesis one. The only other time unit we really have going way back is the week. There's no real astronomical basis for that. However, um, uh, it does stem directly out of the creation week, seven days, six days that God created, seventh day he rested. And he hallowed and sanctified it there at the very beginning. So I think that goes back to the very beginning. Uh, things like hours and minutes, th those are rather late. Uh, those were imposed at a much later time. And they're, they're a bit artificial. The others are either God-given or, or ordained by the, And that's what God, what's being talked about in the, when it talks about being for years and for days and for seasons. And those seasons, the word used there in Hebrew is moed. It's the... Uh, word for the uh, festivals, such as Passover and uh, Sukkot and so forth, those things are uh, uh, fixed by the phases of the moon on, on the Hebrew calendar. It was given at Sinai, particularly what they had before that we don't know. But uh, so those are the purposes given, and it fits very well with what we observe in the world today. So when we look at the moon, uh, you know, the moon raises the tides on Earth. Um, can we learn anything from these tidal effects? Oh, yeah. The, um, what's interesting is uh, the tides are, are very subtle. I mean, they raise, raise a high and low tide twice a day, a little over, uh, a little over 24 hours for the cycle, on average 24 hours and 50 minutes because of the, the fact that the moon's orbiting around the Earth. There's another thing that comes into play, though. The, um, the Earth's rot rapid rotation pulls those bulges ahead a little bit from the uh, line between the Earth and the moon. And the moon's gravity grabs hold of those bulges and acts as a brake, pulling back on the Earth a little bit, causes the Earth's rotation to slow. This has been measured uh, quite, quite accurately. And it's the Earth's rotation is slowing by, I think, 16 ten thousandths of a second per century. Doesn't sound like much, but it does accumulate over time. The accumulated difference uh, going back about 6,000 years is a whole day, as it turns out. So when you're making predictions of eclipses into the past or future, you have to take into account what we call tidal breaking. Now, Newton's third law uh, says for every action is an opposite and equal reaction. So if the moon is producing a torque on the Earth, slowing its rotation, then the Earth must be pulling back on the moon, a torque on it, accelerating it forward. And as it does that, it causes the moon to go to a higher orbit, which causes its actual orbital period to slow down. It's kind of counterintuitive. And uh, so the moon spirals away from us at about uh, two and a little over two inches per year. That too's been measured, believe it or not. <laughs> it's an incredible time which we live. The Apollo astronauts left retro reflectors on the surface of the moon that allow measurement of the distance by to the moon by sending a laser beam off and bouncing it off and coming back. A lot of um, a lot of data reduction goes into it, but they've actually actually been able to um, verify this and measure it very accurately. Now. If you have two two inches or four centimeters per year, it doesn't sound like too much over a few thousand years. <clears throat> but what happens when you go millions of years into the past? Well, the effect doing this, we, we can't predict the amount, but we can model the physics involved in it. It's a very steep function of distance. It goes as the inverse sixth power of the distance. And what that means is when the moon was closer in the past, the um, recession rate of the moon wasn't four centimeters, more like six, and before that, eight, and before that, 12, and before that, 20, and before that, 100 centimeters per year. And so it's a, it's a, a very, I've, run, I've run the numbers, I've actually done the calculations on it, and using the current rate of lunar recession, the uh, moon and the Earth would have been in contact with one another about 1.3 billion years ago. And of course, if the moon were that close to the Earth, it would be shredded and fold to pieces. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, uh, the uh, Earth and moon could not have been orbiting one, one another that long ago. And uh, the tides in the Earth about a billion years ago would have been like a mile high. 
So here in, in northern Kentucky, I would be high, high and low tide twice a day, even more so where you are in Texas. You know, imagine having beachfront property twice a day. <laughs> it would be uh, devastating. And, you know, no biologist and no geologist believes that that ever happened. Uh, so this puts a severe upper limit on the on the uh, age of the Earth and the Moon. They couldn't have been orbiting each other for as much as a billion years, let alone four and a half billion years. It would seem to me that this is a very strong indication that the Earth and Moon are not nearly as old as people think. It doesn't automatically prove that it's only thousands of years old, but at least it's consistent with thousands of years, but inconsistent with billions of years. And so I think it's a good argument that uh, the uh, Supposed age of the Earth and Moon is not as not as um, strong a case as people think. Okay, so the Bible talks about what we can see. It talks about, uh, I believe, it talks about the Belt of Orion, and also talks about Pleiades. But you talk about in your book how these things are moving, and how it can affect what we can see from here and astrophotography and maybe even what can be seen or not seen in the future. Could you speak to that? Yeah, the, you know, Ryan is everybody's favorite constellation. It's one of my, I have two favorites and it's my, my, one of my two favorites. <clears throat> and um, the belt really jumps out at you. It's three lines in a row in the sky, about three degrees apart. It's a wintertime constellation for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. And not too far away is the Pleiades star cluster. It looks like a little tiny knot of stars, uh, resembles slightly a little tiny dipper. And a lot of people think it's a little dipper, but it's not. It, uh, the Japanese name for it, by the way, is Subaru. If you know the symbol of Subaru, it's an oval with mm -hmm. six of those, I think six of those stars uh, inside of that oval. A very recognizable group of stars. And three times are mentioned in the uh, Bible, twice in Job and once in Amos. <clears throat> no, no, no. Um, no mystery as to why they're mentioned together because they're found so close together in the sky. And um, one of the one of the references asks, "Can you uh, loose the bands of Orion or, or set free the Pleiades?" And um, all stars are moving through space. The sun's moving through space as it orbits around the galaxy, the um, a few hundred kilometers per second. Other stars are orbiting too, but their orbits are a little different. They kind of bob up and down. They move a little faster, being an inner orbit, a little slower in the outer orbit. It's very complex. And we've been measuring those proper motions for more than two centuries. We have much better measurements today. And one of the things we do in the planetarium here uh, at the Creation Museum on cloudy nights when we have a sky stargazers program, that's a program we go out to the observatory out back and, and show people the uh, uh, things through the telescope. We have a cloudy night backup in case it's cloudy. We do this, this special program inside. And our grand finale for that is to um, run the stars a million years into the future, our computer-controlled planetarium can do that. We'll take the measured uh, proper motions of stars and run them forward. And you'll see all the constellations start going, stars just going all over the place. But through all of this, the, star, the belt of Orion remains fixed. After a million years of motion, you can still recognize it. It's moved a little bit, but it's recognizable because they're moving together in space. In the Pleiades, they move too, but they hang together. And they're the only two things in the sky that maintain their their um, positions in the sky. It's um, really quite remarkable when we do that, that nothing else that we noticed would be recognizable in a million years from now or a million years in the past. Now, I'm not sure that's exactly what that passage means, um, but it's sure tempting to go there and say, well, this must be referring to this because why would you have those two and only those two mentioned when they're the only ones that would be recognizable long term in the entire sky? And of course, the challenge he has there is, is Job, can you, can you do this? Well, I can. I'm, I'm the creator. I made all of this. So it's an interesting little little tidbit that we didn't really know about until just recent years, actually. Well, I think the Bible gives another stunner that is similar to this. When the Bible predicts, and I'm not talking about just general, hey, that was, you know, a, a lucky guess. You know, the Bible depicts the number of the stars as the number of the sands of the sea. Well, with the naked eye, even the best eyesight on the planet, you could only see a few, a few thousand stars at the most. I mean, even the best eyesight. And I'm thinking that at the time of Galileo, uh, you know, with his telescope and the works he wrote, I mean, he couldn't have seen more than 30,000 stars, I'm guessing, with, with, with that type of telescope. 
And yet the yeah. Bible predicts this <clears throat> massive number that's, you know, uncountable. To the naked eye, you can see a few thousand stars. And there's a guy named Ptolemy uh, 19 centuries ago who did a catalog of stars. And I think he had 1,022 entries. And some people along the way thought, well, that's all the stars that are. And they, they got this attitude that the ancients, the uh, uh, Aristotle and Ptolemy, they knew everything that was needed to know. If you want to find out anything, just read from them. Don't worry about trying to learn anything else, which is a wrong-headed idea. When Galileo um, started using the telescope for astronomy, uh, that he was able to see, uh, look at the Milky Way and see many stars, too faint to be seen with the naked eye, which then showed up through the telescope. And I'm not sure, um, it was a British astronomer about a century ago. It was, I, I want to say it's Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, though it may have been um, another one who, uh, whose name escapes me at this moment, uh, Sir James Jeans, one of the two. Jeans or Eddington uh, once wrote in a book that he compared the number of stars to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on the earth. Now, I don't know if, if, if that person was familiar with the biblical passage. He likely was. Mm -hmm. But this was a secular astronomer making that comparison. And we find back in Genesis when God's giving his promise of his covenant to, to Abraham, he says, look up in the stars, uh, they're innumerable. Uh, I will make your descendants that innumerable. Or look at the sand on the seashore. I will make your, uh, your, your, your descendants that innumerable. And um, you take those two and put them together, and the comparison is very striking. And here, uh, within the past century, an astronomer made just the same comparison uh, to all of that. And I think the main point is not so much as there's one-to-one -one correspondence between the two, as if you could count every grain of sand and you'd know how many stars there are. The point is you can't count all the grains of sand, and you can't count all the stars. The best we can do is estimate, and we do estimate how many stars there are in the galaxy and how many stars there are in the, in the, in the universe. Do you want to hear that estimate? Yeah. It's for the for the uh, Milky Way galaxy. It's a few hundred billion stars. That's based upon the mass we've measured for the uh, pretty accurate with, with a factor of two or so of the um, mass of our own galaxy. If we assume that each solar mass produces one star, then you get a few hundred billion stars. And the current estimates of the number of um, galaxies of size comparable to the Milky Way in the universe is probably on the at least 100 billion uh, galaxies. So if you assume that each galaxy has that many stars, take a few hundred billion times a few hundred billion, I'll leave it up to you folks to multiply it together and figure out how many stars there might be in the universe. Wow, that's just in incredible. Uh, and, and, you know, to me, the Bible goes, I mean, and makes this incredible prediction. Now, they could have thought, you know, somebody said, well, they could have made that up then, and it was the luckiest guess ever, and they didn't ever <laughs> think that it would be verified. But, you know, whenever the Bible does make a prediction like this, it, it comes to pass, which I think, you know, uh, verifies the Bible, gives it what we call veracity. Now, let's speak to the other thing, because the Bible, the Bible says that God makes the earth first, then the sun, moon, and the stars, and that, you know, God has this special view of earth. And he has this garden here and, you know, uh, heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. Um, this is obviously a very, very, very special place in the galaxy. And some people have said, um, and I would be curious to see what you think, that, that our universe is galactocentric in that, you know, it's kind of the center of the center of the center. Um, you know, based upon, you know, things that have been observed from Hubble. And then you have other people who say, no, 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 there's the Big Bang's more of a four, you know, 4D Big Bang, like a balloon. I would be very, very curious to see what, what you would have to say about this. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, little, a little ambivalent about that. The, um, <clears throat> there was a discovery made uh, now almost 50 years ago in the mid-70s, a guy named Alan Tift began looking at redshifts of galaxies, and he saw a periodicity in those redshifts. And if, um, if that's taken at face value, then you're left with um, shells of galaxies moving away from us. And that indicates sort of we might be at the center of the universe. Now, on the other hand, uh, some creation have made a big deal about that. On the other hand, um, there, there could be a selection effect going on here that those shells are, are kind of an illusion because the universe is a pretty clumpy place. And as you look through those clumps of, of matter, you're gonna get the impression that there are shells 
uh, there that you're centered upon. But I, I would argue we're something uh, we're something near the center of the universe, not because we have to be in a special place, but because remember I talked about earlier in this discussion on day two, God made this thing called the expanse or the rakia and expanded it off the earth. And as I understand it, that is the uh, space of the universe. So if if the universe was stretched out or expanded off of the the earth, the space of the universe was, then I would suggest we're somewhere near the center of the universe. We don't have to be exactly at the center, but somewhere near. It's not a strong teaching that I find, but it's a strong implication I draw from the day two account uh, of creation. So I don't really need to find observational evidence of that. I've got some ideas about the cosmology. I think the Bible may be teaching here, but I am I am of the opinion we're probably uh, near the center. And, and by the way, uh, the idea of the universe even having a center is uh, not a welcome concept in cosmology today. Uh, most of them uh, think either the universe is the, is the infinite, which uh, can't be a center, or the universe folds back on itself uh, uh, in, in geometry so that uh, it's like it's like a, in two dimensions, it'd be like the surface of a sphere. The, the surface of a sphere does not have a center. Uh, the sphere itself can, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the surface of a sphere because then you've got like a four-dimensional space involved. So uh, if, if those modern ideas of cosmology are correct, even if the universe is finite, there's still no center to it. And um, I reject all that. I used to believe all that, by, by the way, but in the last decade, I've revised my thinking. I believe that the, um, the universe probably is finite. It probably has an edge, and we're somewhere near the center. And that's just un, un, unfathomable by most astronomers and cosmologists today. Well, you know, if, if we're near the center, <clears throat> You know, it, it almost becomes one of those if true truth, because, you know, it's like Carl Sagan said, you know, how much evidence do you need to believe in extraterrestrials? And he said, just one thing, just one thing. Yeah. And of course, how many miracles need to have ever occurred for there to be a God? Just one. If just one ever occurred, there's a God. It's kind of a, you know, one of those if true, uh-oh, truths. But, you know, if the earth were to actually be the center, I, I mean, I think that's 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 a, a checkmate moment. Now, the, the Bible says that God makes it clear that God designed the world and established order. Um, how does the study of astronomy reveal the, the God of order? Well, I, I wrestle with that. I think some of my creation brethren see design where there may not be any, but I think the earth is a, a very special place. Um, it's an incredible planet. There's nothing like it in the solar system. And we're now seeing that there's nothing like it in the universe. This is not something I, I discussed in this particular book, but I think you've opened the door to this and I need to, I need to go in further. Um, for the past 400 years, people have been speculating that there might be other planets orbiting other stars. Once they came to realize that the Earth is one of several planets orbiting, orbiting the sun, then it came to realize that the sun is also a star. That opened that door up for what we call uh, parallel uh, wor worlds out there. Uh, this was all speculation. It was all conjecture until about 25 years ago when technology advanced to the point that we were able to um, start observing, or I should say detecting uh, planets orbiting other stars. We call these exoplanets. And um, there are several main line ways of doing this, and people keep track of it. Recently, um, the people who keep track of this, the JPL, Jet Proportional Laboratory, they announced they had just uh, had their uh, 5,000th um, exoplanet discovery. More than 5,000 planets now we know about orbiting other stars, and uh, discovery is going every day, really. Uh, so it's really moving forward fast. Now, if you would have gone back 30 years ago and asked almost any astronomer, any scientist for that matter, uh, when, once we discovered 5,000 exoplanets, how many of them would be Earth-like? I think most scientists would have said, oh, probably scores, maybe a few hundred. They would have been certain that there are 5,000, we would have a bunch of planets that are Earth-like, and somehow this is then supposed to prove that, that the Earth is not unique and that life is probably not unique, and so evolution must be true. However, <laughs> what we found is that out of those 5,000 uh, exoplanets, not one of them is truly Earth-like. I know there are a handful they claim are Earth-like, but it doesn't take me very long looking at the information about the, the stars involved to realize that they aren't. Uh, almost all of those Earth-like planets are orbiting around what we call red dwarf stars. These are stars that are a lot fainter and cooler than our own sun. 
So the habitable zone, the area around the sun, that star where a planet can orbit and have liquid water, which we think is essential for life, is quite small, which means they orbit very close, much closer to those stars than, than, uh, than Mercury does around the sun, taking only a week or two for the planets to orbit. This caused a host of problems. Those um, red dwarf stars are known for being uh, uh, flare stars. They produce magnetic storms that uh, would make the flares on the sun seem mild by comparison. And when you're much closer to the uh, to the star than the sun is, you're going to feel those effects far, far more. So the intensity of those solar flare, stellar flares are much greater, and the effect is much greater. And these flares would have the tendency to strip the atmospheres from those planets. Without an atmosphere, you can't have liquid water and you can't have life. Uh, furthermore, they probably have synchronous rotation, meaning one side is facing towards a star at all times. And that would be very bad. One side would be perpetually frozen and dark. The other side would be perpetually uh, warm and light. I would, I would venture a guess that uh, most of the water, if not all the water, would migrate to the frozen side. So you end up with a desert on one side and, and uh, an ice ball, uh, ice semi, semi ball on the other side. So I, my scientific opinion is that uh, there are no Earth-like planets. The evidence is pretty strong, and I've been, I've been calling it for some time. The Earth is unique, and we're unique in the universe. That's what, exactly what you would expect, I think, from a biblical viewpoint, not at all what you would expect from, a, from an evolutionary one. So that's a powerful evidence, again, I think, of the uniqueness of the Earth, and that points towards creation. Well, here's my last question, and then we're going to wrap up, and I want uh, all of our listeners to know how to uh, get a copy of your book and how to find you. But as an astronomer, what is your favorite thing to see through the telescope and why? Hands down, Saturn. <laughs> really? I tell people that all the time. I, uh, as a 14, almost 15-year-old in 1969, September of 69, I uh, looked at Saturn through this little telescope I had. I still have that telescope, believe it or not. Uh, so a couple of years ago was the golden anniversary of that. So in September of that year, I set up a, a table, a folding, folding table in my front yard. I put the little telescope on it and I looked at Saturn, had my picture. My wife took a picture of me looking at Saturn through this little bitty telescope. And I blogged about that, you know, how significant that was to me. I was stunned. It was a, not much of a telescope and, and Saturn was small and it wasn't real bright, but you could see the ball of the planet and the rings very clearly around the uh, planet. I have the opportunity over the years and today to look at Saturn with far more, far better telescopes and I uh, see more detail and it never looks real. People say it looks like a, it looks like a picture, a painting, and it really does. It doesn't look real. It is just a beautiful thing to see. Uh, that is hands down my favorite thing to look at through the telescope. I never get tired of it, and I never get tired of sharing it with people. Wow. Well, Dr. Danny Faulkner, how do we uh, stay in touch with you? How do we find you, website? Uh, how do we get a copy of this book, which is amazing, right. The Heavens? I, uh, I work at Answers in Genesis, so the best way to get more information is and, and purchase the book, for that matter, is go to our website, which is just one word, answersingenesis.org. It's not com, it's .org, answersingenesis.org. Uh, we have the new articles every day, quite literally every day, that go up, and it's very searchable. I search it quite, for, in fact, this morning I was working on something, and I searched for it for an article of mine I'd written. And we have thousands, maybe tens of thousands of articles archived there now. We also have blogs. I have a blog I do from time to time. Uh, there, and you can also go to our store and purchase that book and uh, other books that I've written and other materials that we, we promote here at the, uh, Answers in Genesis. Uh, physically, we're located um, at the Creation Museum here in northern Kentucky. It's uh, suburban Cincinnati. We also run the Ark Encounter about 40 miles south. It's still in the northern part of Kentucky. People come and usually uh, take a few days to visit either attraction. So I encourage people to come see us, but if not, uh, and in addition to, check out our website, answersingenesis.org, and you can find out all sorts of um, answers to your questions. Well, you've been listening to Dr. Danny Faulkner, and he's absolutely amazing. We want to invite him back to talk about some of his other books. You've heard about the heavens today. I invite you to uh, keep up with us as well. Uh, we're at defendingthefaith.law. And there you can find out about our cases, what we're doing. Be sure and sign up for our email list. We 
uh, list uh, uh, different information that's coming out on our cases and also what's coming out on our podcast. Uh, we also have free resources available. Our newest ebook is called Objection Overruled how to answer the top 10 objections to Christianity. You can find all kinds of good stuff on the website, defendingthefaith.law. We appreciate you listening. I hope that you will send this episode to someone who needs to hear it. So be sure and share it. Tell people about it because there's not many episodes like this one. This has been absolutely incredible. Well, God bless you, and we will see you in the next episode of Defending the Faith.